Okay, welcome back everybody to the second portion of lecture 2-1. So this portion is specifically about the spinal cord. So of course the spinal cord is located in the vertebral canal. And the spinal cord is continuous with the brain stem traveling through the foramen magnum uh, to uh, enter the cranial cavity. Uh, so of course the spinal cord is going to uh, have a different morphology. It's going to look different, have different anatomical features based on what location in the vertebral column it's in. So we can see here these different um, drawings of the spinal cord cross sections in different regions of the uh, spine. So these are cross sections, so we're slicing the spinal cord horizontally uh, as we go down the back. And we can see in the cervical region uh, the spinal cord, especially the difference between the gray matter and the white matter, uh, is different. The shape of the gray matter changes. And so you may, uh, as a test question, be asked to identify what region of the, uh, what spinal cord segment a specific cross section comes from. That's a viable question. But the important details is why the spinal cord shape is changing as we travel through the vertebral canal. So the shape of the gray matter is changing because of the different functionalities based on the different regions of the body. So imagine, for instance, uh, that uh, the spinal cord segment in the lower cervical uh, region, it's responsible for innervating not just the muscles in that region of the neck and back, but it's also responsible for innervating the limbs, the upper limbs, the arms, and all of the movement of the arms. So you would imagine, because there's more musculature in this region of the body, that you're going to need more motor neurons in that region of the spinal cord so that you can have fine control over each and every finger and arm movement. And in fact, that is the case. So in the lower cervical region, uh, we see that the anterior horn, which contains the motor neurons, is actually much larger in that region of the spinal cord. Uh, so that accounts for that difference. Now let's go down into the lower portion of the body, into the uh, lower lumbar portion and the sacral portion. We see here that, again, we're going to have a larger uh, uh, motor neuron uh, anterior horn portion of that spinal cord region. So of course to reiterate dorsal horn is sensory, anterior horn is a uh, predominantly motor, and then the intermediate gray is going to have inner neurons that are involved in um, some proprioception but mainly autonomic functions. Autonomic functions are also known as visceromotor because uh, because autonomics are an output uh, function. <clears throat> so as we drill down and look in more detail the, uh, the, the function of these different regions, we end up noticing that there are different functional nuclei. So a nucleus is a uh, concentrated region within the gray matter of the nervous system which uh, shares a specific function. So uh, the next few slides uh, outline the different functions of these different regions. As we are in the uh, most dorsal portion of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, the first nuclei we'll encounter is a region called substantia gelatinosum. So this region is the termination for nociceptors or pain receptors uh, from the peripheral portion of the body. So that's uh, sensory, and it's probably one of the most critical sensory components, pain reception, called nociception. Next, we travel uh, farther into the dorsal horn, um, closer uh, to the intermediate uh, region, and we'll, have, we'll find the nucleus proprius. So this is the termination point for a lot of the general sensory input, such as um, pressure and two-point discrimination sorts of uh, things. 
But as we uh, look now into the anterior horn, number three in this pale green color is going to be the location of some of the motor neurons. Number three here in particular is the medial nucleus of the ventral horn. So that's somatomotor output. And in particular, it's in the medial portion of the anterior horn. Because it's closer to the medial portion, it's actually going to innervate and cause the contraction of more medial musculature in the body. So already we're seeing a somatotopic organization to these nuclei. So the medial nucleus of the ventral horn is going to innervate those axial muscles up and down the core of the body. So if there's a medial nucleus of the ventral horn, there is of course a lateral nucleus of the ventral horn, number six. We can see that more laterally uh, in sections in the uh, sections about C7 and about S2 and up into the lower lumbar. So the lateral nucleus of the ventral horn is going to be responsible not for those core muscles, but for the more peripheral muscles of the limbs. So you'll see the lateral nucleus of the ventral horn only in the regions of the spinal cord that innervate limb structures. For instance, in about C7 and in about lower lumbar and the sacral portions. And that's in fact what we see. We, we see what we expect in this case. And so again, we're getting a sense for that somatotopic organization of the body very quickly. Uh, also listed here, the dorsal nucleus of Clark, number four, uh, is more medial uh, and it's uh, part of the proprioceptive system. So it's a sensory system that's going to uh, inform the cerebellum about the orientation of the body. So proprioception is kind of like your sixth sense. It tells you how your body is oriented in space. And so uh, dorsal nucleus of Clark is responsible for that kind of non-conscious proprioception. Then we have the uh, intermediate lateral cell column, also called the IML. So you may hear me call it the IML from time to time. And this is the location of the sympathetic uh, motor neurons or visceromotor neurons. So these IML neurons, they're going to be located uh, in the, the thoracic region because that is the source of sympathetic neurons in the spinal cord. And so, in fact, we don't see IML neurons in the intermediate portion in C7 or down in lumbar or the sacral. We only see it here in the thoracic portion. You can see it just on the edge, labeled number five. <clears throat> so moving on from that, we have some specialized neurons, uh, nuclei in the spinal cord that I'll talk about, which will become even more and more important as we build on this information. So each one of these lectures is going to build on uh, the, the prior information. And my hope is that as we build on that, it doesn't become an avalanche of information, but it reinforces the knowledge you have to make it clearer. So here in the upper cervical spinal cord, we have a nucleus called the accessory nucleus. And this is uh, specifically responsible for innervating some of the neck muscles uh, that orient the head, that turn the head. Uh, so in particular, the sternocleidomastoid, as well as the trapezius. The phrenic nucleus, as you may suspect from its name, innervates the diaphragm. Uh, so it forms the phrenic nerve that uh, exits the spinal cord at C3, 4, and 5. And that phrenic nerve in C3, 4, and 5 keeps the diaphragm alive, keeps the diaphragm contracting. So if an individual uh, has damage to the uh, spinal cord above C3, 4, and 5, they are going to lose the ability to innervate their diaphragm because the upper motor neurons that innervate the phrenic nucleus will be severed. So um, those individuals will have to be on a respirator um, to, in order to breathe. And then <clears throat> mentioning here 
the uh, parasympathetics. We talked about the sympathetics. So parasympathetics are located in two places in the central nervous system. The first is in the brain stem. So that's not represented here because this is only the spinal cord. The second location is in the sacrum. Uh, so those sacral parasympathetics located in S2, 3, and 4, and you can see those kind of in the location of the IML, but in the sacral spinal cord. So those will perform parasympathetic innervation to the pelvis. Something that you need to be aware of, but you don't need to memorize, that I'm not going to ask you about as a test question, are Rexed's laminas. So Rexed was an individual who looked at the gray matter of the spinal cord under a microscope, and he saw different uh, histological uh, orient or structures within different regions of the spinal cord. And so he categorized those different regions of the spinal cord based on um, the different uh, appearances that he saw under the microscope. <clears throat> because form and function are closely related, Rexed's laminas do correlate with nuclei, but only loosely. So they're not a perfect one-to-one -one correlation. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, you may see a uh, radiologist in the history of one of your patients mention that um, there is uh, ischemic damage to Rexed's laminas uh, one and two. And so you would understand that that means that sensory impairment has occurred um, uh, perhaps in the uh, nociceptive sensors that are in the more dorsal portion of the uh, dorsal horn. So it's important to understand that that nomenclature exists. But I'm not going to ask you to correlate nuclei and Rexed's laminas. I am not giving you that much information. <clears throat> so we've talked about the gray matter of the spinal cord. Let's move on to the white matter. So the white matter of the spinal cord, we, uh, as anatomists are wont to do, we differentiate it uh, into different regions. Uh, so uh, anatomists think it's fun to uh, describe different uh, funiculi, so we've named them funiculi. You'll see we have one, um, or, or uh, we have anterior funiculi, uh, which uh, basically we have one that covers both bilateral portions of the spinal cord. We have two lateral funiculi on either side of the gray matter. And then posteriorly, we have the uh, one posterior funiculus. <clears throat> so within these funiculi are different tracts. Tracts are bundles of axons that are going up and down the spinal cord. So again, this is a cross section uh, horizontally or axially through the spinal cord. And we're seeing a top down view of that spinal cord. So these white matter, the nuclei are located uh, as cells within these certain regions of the gray matter. The white matter tracts are going in and out of a specific section, up and down the spinal cord. So those are what tracts are. So uh, these tracts can also be called fasciculi or a fasciculus, singular. And so we have different systems in the spinal cord. We have ascending and descending uh, fasciculi. So first here, I'm showing you some of the ascending systems. So when we say ascending, that is synonymous with uh, afferent, meaning going into the central nervous system, going into the brain. So that means these are all sensory tracts of some variety. Some are conscious, some are unconscious. And some are part of unconscious uh, reflex loops or proprioceptive loops, but uh, all of these systems are ascending sensory systems. So the first of these that we'll talk about is the fasciculus gracilis. 
fasciculus gracilis is responsible for fine sensory input, such as two-point discrimination, vibration, uh, those sorts of things, or detailed proprioceptive information. Fasciculus gracilis uh, is providing information from the lower half of the body, from the lower trunk, as well as the legs. The next uh, we'll talk about is the fasciculus cuneatus. Same sensory information, but this is coming from the upper trunk and the upper limbs. So imagine the different regions of the spinal cord. Would you see, for instance, fasciculus cuneatus in a lumbar section of the spinal cord? Would you see fasciculus cuneatus in a sacral portion of the spinal cord? So remember, it's doing uh, upper limbs and upper trunk. So we are above, uh, the, the upper limbs are above the uh, lumbar region. So there's going to be no ascending fasciculus cuneatus in the lumbar region because the upper limbs haven't, you know, we haven't gotten to those yet. Whereas the fasciculus gracilis is responsible for all of the lower portion of the body. So as we go up from the sacrum to the lumbar portions, the fasciculus gracilis is going to get bigger and bigger in those spinal cord sections until we reach the uh, thoracic region of the, of the spinal cord. And then that fasciculus uh, gracilis will stop growing and it will maintain its size and it will just go straight up toward the uh, brain. <clears throat> So you have to think about what uh, regions of the body these tracts are responsible for and where you'll find them. And this is critical diagnostic information. If you know a patient has these symptoms, they uh, can't sense anything from their legs, then you know that they have damage to the fasciculus uh, gracilis. So you can predict without any imaging where the damage is going to occur in a patient. So uh, now we have what are called spinocerebellar tracts. So these tracts, uh, based solely on their name, they're going to travel from the spinal cord to the cerebellum. So you can imagine these are proprioceptive tracts that send information about body orientation to the cerebellum. Uh, so these are going to be mostly non-conscious tracts because they're not going to the cortex of the brain, they're going to the cerebellum. The cerebellum does automatic uh, uh, proprioceptive correction to control your balance. You don't have to, when you're standing up, you don't have to constantly think about what muscles you need to activate in order to maintain your balance. That's done automatically for you through the cerebellum. So uh, that's what we have here. Uh, two different tracts that convey that non-conscious sense and they're located uh, posteriorly and anteriorly. And we'll see that they have different pathways to the cerebellum later on. <clears throat> now we have two more conscious uh, sensory tracts called the spinothalamic tracts. These are also sometimes referred to as the uh, anterior lateral tracts. Uh, combined. They may be referred to as that, or they may be referred to as spinothalamic. So we have the anterior spinothalamic in green and the lateral spinothalamic in yellow. So lateral spinothalamic, the rule of thumb is that they are responsible more for uh, the sensations of sharp pain, whereas the anterior spinothalamic are more about um, less acute signals like deep pressure, uh, temperature, uh, crude touch, those sorts of things, duller sensations. Uh, that's not exclusively true, but it's broadly true. So that if you have a patient who can sense pressure that you apply on their hand, but can't sense a pinprick, then uh, they're likely to have damage to the lateral spinothalamic tract, and that can occur um, due to uh, microstrokes in the spinal cord, which we'll get to the vasculature in just a few moments. So 
We have ascending tracks. We also have descending tracks. The descending tracks are top down. They go from the cortex down to, or the cerebellum, down into the spinal cord. Uh, so these are going to be conscious and unconscious, non-conscious uh, motor systems. <clears throat> so we have a uh, corticospinal tracts, a lateral corticospinal tract, and an anterior corticospinal tract. These corticospinal tracts are uh, composed of the fibers from the upper motor neurons in the cortex descending down to innervate the lower motor neurons. So the lateral corticospinal tract, it's more lateral, it is going to uh, uh, be the upper motor neurons that represent mostly limb movements like the arms and the legs. The anterior corticospinal tract is more central, more medial in the spinal cord. So that is going to be responsible for innervation of the axial musculature, conscious axial musculature contraction. So again, location uh, correlates with function. We have that somatotopic organization. <clears throat> so next we have the rubrospinal tract. Rubrospinal tract is an alternate tract for upper, mostly upper limb movements. We have the vestibulospinal tracts, a lateral and a medial, and those are going to be responsible for uh, balance, uh, functions of balance, especially in the head and neck region, orienting the head in relation to the center of gravity of the body. And finally, we have uh, close to the medial vestibulospinal tract here in blue, we have the tectospinal tract. And so this is going to be part of uh, coordinating eye movements, uh, especially reflexive eye movements. Like if something flies into your peripheral vision and you automatically, your eyes just are drawn to it, that's the tectospinal tract uh, moving your eyes in a rapid sense. So you can begin to think about how these different tracts uh, have different functionality and how the, the um, this can relate to patient symptoms. And so as you develop this kind of um, uh, uh, Rolodex in your head of all of this information, correlate the concepts and the functionality of these different regions, then you can start to uh, think about how to diagnose individuals based on their motor movements or their sensory impairments, uh, things like that. Testing the strength of individual muscles to determine if there's weakness in different tracts or different locations in the spinal cord, for instance. And so this picture here, draw, this drawing, is showing you how the different spinal cord segments are named. The nomenclature isn't based on where the spinal cord uh, is, it's based on where the spinal nerve is exiting. So. The, as you can see, as we get lower in the spinal cord, the spinal nerves that exit the spinal cord start descending at a steeper and steeper angle before they exit the vertebral column. So you can see in particular, for instance, the third lumbar section, L3, uh, originates up here in the lumbar region of the spinal cord and descends down to exit below L3. However, at the L3 uh, vertebral segment, there is no spinal cord. So the actual L3 uh, spinal cord segment is located in the thoracic portion of the vertebral column. So the name of the spinal cord segment is named after where the spinal nerve exits not what spine, what vertebral segment it's located at. So just be aware of that difference between the vertebral segment and the spinal segment on nomenclature. This also has some consequences because as you note, the spinal cord ends at about the L2 vertebrae. 
So if a physician needs to sample the cerebrospinal fluid, or if a physician needs to numb some of the nerves that are exiting, exiting down in the pelvic region, they can inject or extract below the L2 vertebrae. So they can palpate and find the L2 vertebrae and then uh, stick that uh, epidural needle in there and inject uh, anesthetic agent. Uh, so that's how the epidural is uh, given uh, during childbirth, for instance, and being assured to avoid damage to the spinal cord. You'll also notice one other distinction that I need to uh, point out is that the nomenclature for the cervical section is different than the nomenclature for the rest of the spinal cord. That's because we have an extra uh, spinal nerve in the cervical section. So if you'll notice, C1 spinal nerve exits above the C1 spinal cord. Then we go down to C7, and we notice we have a C8 spinal nerve. So C8 spinal nerve exits below C7, above T1. From there on out, the spinal nerves are named after the uh, vertebrae above which they exit. So T1 nerve exits below the T1 vertebrae. So the consequence of all this uh, results in what we call dermatomes as well as myotomes. And these are critical for diagnosing patient conditions. So here I'm showing you a picture of the different dermatomes. And we can note that there, there, there are specific landmarks uh, we can use on the external body as kind of a guide to the dermatomes. So the T4 dermatome is located at about the areola, the nipples of the thorax. The umbilicus or the belly button uh, is located at about the T10 uh, dermatome. Or, so the T10 spinal nerve is innervating the region around the umbilicus to the sides of the abdomen. So in this, in this way, as you are evaluating a patient uh, for sensory deficits, you can come to a conclusion about where the nerve damage has occurred, again, without any imaging, just by doing a neurological exam. And in a similar way, there are myotomes, which are not pictured here, which show you uh, which regions of the body are innervated by which spinal nerves. So again, you can do muscle strength tests or movement tests to test the different myotomes and come to a conclusion about what spinal cord segments might be damaged or what nerves might be impaired in an individual. <clears throat> so we're talking about these spinal nerves exiting the spinal cord. Let's take a closer look at what that looks like. So here we have a uh, drawing of the spinal cord and we've taken a, a, a section off the top uh, where we can see the gray matter within the spinal uh, cord. We can see that the spinal cord has a dorsal horn and a ventral horn in the gray matter. We can see that there are anterior rootlets and uh, dorsal rootlets. So the dorsal rootlets provide incoming sensory information to the dorsal horn. The ventral horn rootlets are the lower motor neuron axons traveling out of the spinal cord to uh, innervate a muscle in the peripheral body. Those nerves come together, uh, those rootlets, I should say, come together to form a spinal nerve. That spinal nerve will uh, then branch to provide the individual nerves and branches to the different portions of the body. Uh, so here we see where those uh, two rootlets come together is termed the spinal nerve. After the spinal nerve is formed, we'll have what are called rami. Rami are the initial branches that travel either dorsally or ventrally uh, to innervate the different dorsal or ventral portions of the body. 
We also have gray and white rami communicans. Those structures are part of the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic fibers branch off of the rami uh, very quickly and form their own network within the body. We'll talk about autonomics later. Right now, I'm mostly concerned with the sensory and motor components called the somatosensory and somatomotor components of the spinal cord. So we'll click through here, uh, highlighting those different regions. And the spinal cord itself is encased in connective tissue, just like the brain. The brain is also encased in this same connective tissue. So surrounding, protecting, and, um, uh, and uh, um, localizing, keeping the spinal cord in place is a tough connective tissue structure called the dura mater. Uh, Deep to the dura mater is what's called the arachnoid mater, named because it has wispy uh, spider web like uh, uh, extensions. <clears throat> then, adherent to the surface of the spinal cord is the pia mater. Uh, the pia mater is uh, the location where you will find all of the vasculature of the central nervous system. So, as these rootlets come out, they pierce through the dura mater, and that dura mater continues with them to form part of the nerve. So the dura mater in the periphery is called the epineurium, and it surrounds and encases nerves to protect them and keep the axons bundled together. So again, clicking through these slides. So now let's talk about the vertebral column and how it's structured. So the vertebral column has some natural curvatures to it. These are called lordotic and kephotic curves. So the uh, two natural uh, lordotic curves are located in the lumbar and the cervical region, whereas the kephotic curves are located in the thoracic and the sacral regions. So as these become over, um, over curved or, or curved in the wrong direction that can result in things like hunchback uh, conditions, postural problems. <clears throat> so here we see uh, what I'm emphasizing on this slide is that the curvatures of the spinal cord and, and in fact most of the structures of the body are to some degree um, uh, dependent upon culture. So in the middle here, we see two different textbook drawings of the uh, vertebral column. The one on the right is a modern textbook showing these um, uh, exacerbated S-shaped spine with the, uh, uh, the lordotic curves in the cervical and the sacral regions. On the left uh, in the center, we have a drawing from an anatomy textbook published in 1897. And you can see the differences between those two vertebral columns. The one from 1897 is much more upright and vertical than the uh, S-shaped one from a modern textbook. And that's because lifestyles were different. People spent more time standing, walking, uh, long distances, and so their postures were naturally better, whereas in modern life we spend most of our day sitting in chairs, um, maybe hunched over a computer, and that exacerbates those uh, curvatures. But this isn't just time-based. There are different cultures today uh, that have different uh, vertebral structures. So on the left, we see uh, a picture of the posture of uh, some... Uh, young men of the Ubong tribe uh, from the island of Borneo. And so you can see that their shoulder blades are held back. Uh, their gluteal region is naturally tight. It's passively activated. Uh, and that causes a very upright and straight posture. You can see uh, even the elbows are back uh, toward the uh, lumbar curve, maybe even behind the back. So their entire center of gravity is uh, more upright uh, and um, you know 
more functional for their lifestyle. Uh, <clears throat> so you can see on the right an image of a woman from Burkina Faso, and you can uh, see how upright her cervical and, and thoracic region is, but also uh, notice how she's holding her child. She's holding her child underneath the child's arms around the thoracic region of the back. We hold our children with their butts resting on our arms so that their upper portion, the weight of it, collapses downward. So the entire culture here is going to facilitate the lengthening of the spine and an upright posture. And so when you encounter patients, it's important to realize that there is not one correct posture or one uh, av average, really, that it's going to be different depending upon the culture and the origin of an individual. And you need to take this into account when you're performing your diagnostic criteria. <clears throat> so uh, now at this point uh, in the lecture, you're going to be responsible for identifying all the structures of the vertebrae, all the bumps, all the grooves. And so the rest of this slide deck is describing those features of the different vertebrae and the different, uh, so the vertebrae look different in different regions of the vertebral column. This first slide is a picture of an idealized vertebrae. You can see the vertebral body that forms the anterior most portion of the vertebrae. So the axis of uh, flexion and extension of the back goes straight through the center of the vertebral body. That's the axis. Uh, coming up off of the vertebral body. So think of the vertebral body as the floor. Uh, coming up off of it is a post or a pedicle. It's called a pedicle. Uh, the pedicle holds up the lamina or the roof, the arch of the vertebral body. And within that arch forms the vertebral canal uh, within which the spinal cord is located. And of course, every vertebrae has to have an articular process with its uh, superior and inferior partner. Uh, so we see those superior articular processes here and here. And then it also has to have attachment points for the musculature, the axial musculature. So those are the transverse and the spinous processes. <clears throat> As we go through the different regions of the uh, vertebral column, we'll notice that the vertebrae have different appearances. So in the upper cervical region, we'll notice that the spinous process is bifid, it's split. Uh, so that's a key indicator that you have a cervical vertebrae. We also have a transverse foramen because in the cervical region, the spinal artery travels through the transverse foramen, and that's not found in the thoracic and lower portions of the vertebral column. So make note of these differences. As we get into like the C7 vertebrae, that bifid process is gone, uh, and we go into an appearance more like these thoracic vertebrae, where the thoracic vertebrae have a long angled spinous process. We also notice that the transverse processes head out at more of a 45 degree angle, and they have articular processes on them for the ribs. So here I'm showing you how those ribs coordinate or associate with the thoracic vertebrae. Moving on, the lumbar vertebrae have a much more rounded and bulbous looking spinous process. Uh, they lose those articular processes because there are no ribs in the lumbar region. Instead, what uh, they develop are mammillary processes. These mammillary processes are an important attachment point for the uh, lumbar axial musculature. Then we get into the sacrum. Uh, so originally, developmentally, the sacrum develops from a multitude of different, um, of different uh, vertebral processes, different vertebral bones that fuse during development. And so you can see those fusion points in these transverse lines. But the, uh, 
moving on to the previous, the next slide in the sacral section, we can see the sacral canal is a continuation of that vertebral canal. But in the sacral region, of course, there's no spinal cord. There's just the cauda equina, the tail of the spinal cord, which is which forms the uh, uh, which the rootlets, which form the spinal nerves, as they exit these uh, foramina. So make note of the formulations uh, in which uh, the naming processes. So. Foramen and foramina are holes or, or little holes uh, in bones. Tubercles, processes, uh, those sorts of things are, are bumps. Uh, so make note of and, and kind of start categorizing in your head the different ways in which these processes and bumps and stuff are named. So let's take a look here at the spinal cord in situ in a cervical vertebrae. We know it's a cervical vertebrae because we have the, uh, the bifid spinous process here. There's another way we know it's the uh, cervical vertebrae because we have the vertebral artery in the transverse, uh, uh, in the, uh, transverse foramen here. But notice the uh, dorsal root ganglion, also called the spinal ganglion, located within this intervertebral foramen where the rootlets exit. So our spinal nerve is forming after, uh, after the intervertebral foramen, more distal from or more peripheral from the intervertebral foramen. So the question I wanna uh, pose to you is how is uh, the spinal cord supplied, irrigated by blood? And then I want you to think about uh, ways in which uh, uh, things like ischemic strokes uh, can occur in the spinal cord and can result in damage to these different uh, gray matter and white matter tracts. So in fact, the, um, we have what are called segmental arteries, or in this case, more specifically, posterior intercostal arteries, because we're in the thoracic region, this is a thoracic vertebrae with ribs, so here it's called an intercostal artery. Those branch directly from the high pressure aorta. So as the blood is flowing uh, through these segmental arteries, there's one in every segment of the uh, vertebral column, uh, it gives off a posterior branch. That posterior branch give, then gives off immediately a spinal branch that travels with the spinal nerve, supplies the dorsal root ganglion, and continues to travel uh, to follow the rootlets as a uh, medullary artery. Uh, a, so it forms an anterior and a posterior segmental medullary artery, following those spinal nerves. <clears throat> those, so here we have a different view of the posterior and anterior segmental arteries. The anterior segmental arteries go to the anterior spinal artery. They anastomose or join with the anterior spinal artery in the anterior sulcus of the spinal cord. The posterior segmental arteries anastomose with the posterior spinal artery. <clears throat> so from there, we have circumferential arteries uh, that travel all the way around the spinal cord. And those circumferential arteries give off radial branches that supply the outer portion of the gray matter, or the white matter, uh, sorry. The, uh, we also have a sulcal artery that goes in the anterior sulcus and supplies the different regions of the gray matter. So you can imagine that you have a, um, a, a, a plaque, uh, an atherosclerotic plaque that breaks off um, and is traveling through the aorta uh, and ends up getting pushed into one of these segmental arteries, uh, traveling into uh, this network that supplies the spinal cord and perhaps it travels into this uh, sulcal artery and can very specifically occlude a branch that's supplying one of the nuclei. 
So in that way, you can have a very specific uh, type of damage to one segment and one functionality in one dermatome of a patient on one side of their body. So by understanding all of this information, you can uh, very quickly diagnose a patient uh, with, uh, with just a simple neurological exam, a sensory exam or a motor testing exam. So here you can take a look at the C1 and C2 vertebrae, which are highly specialized to fix the head in place and to protect the uh, upper cervical uh, spinal cord from damage. Uh, so you can see the dens of C2 uh, coordinating within the facet of C1 to cause a very stiff uh, joint in the upper cervical region. And so that's it for this lecture, uh, and we will uh, get into more detail about those white matter tracts and follow their path as they enter the, server, uh, the uh, central nervous system. Uh, later on in the course as we progress and build onto this information. Uh, so, um, see you then.